Soulmate webinar, the 10 no-nos in international shipping. My name is Karen Grant and I'll be your instructor today. So first topic is a big one and it is that there will be an update. I'm guesstimating it's going to be this week because we never have exact timeframes on updates not even we generally not until like an hour before do we know if an update is going to happen on a particular day but i can tell you that it's very very close so i'm throwing this week out there in hopes that i'm not going to be wrong on that um dhl is making some changes so if you want to uh you know to see what this is about not only do you need to update but then you need to read that update guide the update guide is going to tell you the changes and the changes are important with dhl um, and they're the first of um, I, what I think will be several changes. But if you're wondering, gosh, what's PC Synergy been doing? I haven't had a, you know, any feature update. Well, just like last year, we've got carriers banging on our doors saying, hey, can you make changes for us? So, of course, we always want to make changes. And this is a good one. Uh, so be on the watch out. We will send you an email when we release this. I anticipate it'll be in the next 72 hours, maybe the next 48 hours. So. Uh, hopefully, certainly by Friday of this week, uh, we, we anticipate this. Um, and it will be called 11.7.3. And if you ever wonder what post will make update your version you're currently running, you can go up to the top to help and about to find that. We're going to get right into the meat and potatoes of this with the 10 no-nos. Um, many of you do a lot of international shipping, but if you're like even i and folks i've been teaching international shipping for well on 20 years now and i still would used to get butterflies in my stomach when a shipper would come in to ship international and not only that but have you noticed that the moment you have somebody in that comes to to ship international three other people will come in behind them and have to wait in line it always works out that way it just it's just cruel the way it happens so <laughs> so international shipping like webinars are a magnet for customers so if you had international shipping and webinars all the time you'd just be filthy rich so let's get forward these are things i want you to be aware i'm not telling you you absolutely cannot ship all of these i'm telling you that these are things that you need to watch out for and check on so here we go the first thing is food basically if you put it in your mouth you probably ought not to ship not to ship it or at least you need to check um it is absolutely true that these things cannot be shipped to many countries i would go so far as to say that most of these things cannot be sent to 99.9 .9 of the countries don't try to send fruit to countries don't try to send meat to countries oh my gosh spices and candy also um candy especially chocolates um it's crazy so if you can consume it don't even think of shipping it or if you do you're going to need to check it check if you can and i am going to give you some links on where you can check things um, nobody makes it easy but it, i'm going to make it better than it was the next thing you do not want to ship or you need to check are medicines both prescription and over-the-counter vitamins supplements and any chemicals um, folks, just because it's legal in the United States does not mean it's a legal substance in another country. Every country has their version of the FDA and things have, substances have to be approved. And in some countries, if they're not approved, they're not allowed. So because Tylenol and um, ibuprofen, acetaminophen and ibuprofen are acceptable here doesn't make them acceptable everywhere else. Same thing with vitamin A or St. John's wort or any uh, you know any other type of um, item protein supplements it may not be acceptable in the country you're sending it um, my first experience with this in a bad way was early in my career so we're going to put that in the late 80s and be done with that uh, in the late 80s i had a customer come in and her mother was in paris france on vacation i think she extended her holiday or or something and she didn't have her estrogen pills with her and she only needed another five days supply and so and this is again this is 30 years ago folks so the daughter wanted to send five days worth of estrogen five little estrogen pills we all know that those are relatively harmless things 
So she sent them to him. Now they did get through. They won't always get through. In fact, today I would say that it would be unlikely those would get through to France. But at that time and period, it got through. But the duties tax on that was $500, $100 per pill. So you can, you know, you see that it's crazy. So just be very careful with these type of things. And chemicals, I don't even mean just chemicals you can consume. I mean, any type of chemicals. <clears throat> so, and oddly enough, one of the things that's on every list is anything radioactive. Well, no kidding, right? We don't need to be a Sherlock to figure out that we probably don't wanna be sending radioactive, but it's on the lists. The next thing, number three is textiles. That would be wood, burlap, raw fabric, things like that. <clears throat> now, this one is really picky and there's multiple reasons for this. The number one reason is infestations. Wood can have termites and worms and all kinds of things. Same thing with um, any kind of fabrics as you can imagine can have disease and insects on them. Let me also tell you, there's a second reason that some of these things cannot be shipped. Um, or they can be shipped, but they need to have a certificate of origin with them. And that is to determine where the product came from originally. A certificate of origin means where did that item first come from? You know, if it was growing in the ground, where was it growing in the ground? Um, and so one of the main reasons for a certificate of origin is to see if the place of origin it has a political conflict with the country it's going to. So for example, um, again, early in my career, not quite 30 years ago, probably about 20 years ago, we sent a picture to Australia and it was a canvas picture. And in actuality, um, it was it, on a loose canvas and we had rolled it and put it in a tube and sent it to Australia and it, this was DHL. And the problem was my employee at the time, who was a wonderful employee, she had one bad habit and I couldn't kill, kick her, that habit. I, oh man, she used to make me crazy. She would fill out the customs forms on behalf of the customer. And I used to chew her out all the time for this. But man, mind you, I live in a snowbird area. Our customers are old. It was complex for them. They couldn't write well. So she just, for, for the sake of time, she used to fill out the customs form. So when it came time to put this picture, I think she wrote, put in painting, um, and she put that on the painting or picture on the customs form. The customs form is read separately from the package. A lot of people don't know that. The customs form is often read separately from the package. And so when DHL scanned that, that form and saw picture, they of course presumed it was in a frame and they have to assume that that frame might be wood. That whole thing was put in quarantine because of the wood frame that didn't exist with that, I, that object. And the idea is, or the problem was, um, Australia and many countries will not accept any wood product that came from the country Liberia in Africa because of the guerrilla warfare going on there and so on and so forth, political issues. But nevertheless, it took me four weeks to get that tube out of Australian uh, quarantine because of the un, un, uh, <laughs> unknown wood frame that didn't exist. So. Yeah, so there's just a story of why those those things can't happen. Next thing is know your religions. Now, I don't expect any of you to be religious experts. That's not your job. Some of you might be. But any religious items, book, books, literature, media, going to a country who has already a religion that might be in opposition to that, what I'm calling friend, you know, dueling religions. Um, you wouldn't send something Jewish to... Um, Saudi Arabia, you wouldn't send something Muslim to Israel, uh, but it's not just the Middle East, but I will tell you that's the primary focus of this slide is the Middle East. Um, there is some also um, in Africa. There are countries that won't allow religious symbols on the outside of boxes, yet there are some countries where putting religious symbols are helpful to getting an item through. So I'll give you an example of that. Um, I live in Arizona and my stores were in Arizona and we did an awful lot of shipping to Mexico. And unfortunately, Mexico um, is not known for, um, for safety of packages in some circumstances. There was a lot of theft. 
And so we made it a habit, habit to hit the dollar store on a regular basis and pick up religious stickers, um, off, preferably Catholic style. Um, and we would put these stickers on, on the outside of a box going to Mexico, because if a bad guy in Mexico has the choice of stealing a package with religious stickers or stealing one without, you know, it, their grandmother was religious and taught them better, whether they chose to follow that or not. So they would almost always choose. It, it just really, we just saw a, a vast increase in packages that got through with the religious stickers. So what I'm saying is know what you're sending. The other time you really need to be aware of this is sending to an APO, FPO, DPO, okay? You cannot, for example, there, there are rules about sending um, let's say you've got a soldier who's in Afghanistan or somewhere in the Middle East, wherever they are right now. You cannot send a box full of Bibles. Even though the soldier's allowed to have a Bible, you cannot send a stack of pamphlets, of religious pamphlets, um, unless they happen to be Muslim. Um, but yeah, you cannot do that. Now, you are they, your customer is allowed to send one for, <clears throat> for individual use, but when you send more than one, then that would be what's called proselyting or spreading the word, as Christians sometimes say, and that's not allowed. So you must uh, you must uh, work with that and um, and respect that when shipping. Next item, number five. Used clothing, even if it's in part of personal effects, is not allowed to, I'm gonna take a guess, and I'm sure I'm wrong on this, I'm gonna say at least a third of the world does not accept used clothing. So sometimes it's sent in um, you know, humanitarian interests. Um, sometimes you might have a country that was hit with a, you know, a cyclone, typhoon, whatever, and you might have a group of people that want to send used clothing to them. It's possible that that would not ever get through. Sometimes a person is visiting and just needs to have extra clothing. Again, this is something that may not get through. So please always check. Um, obviously, the kind of orange color gives you an idea of one of the concerns of a foreign country on that. Uh, we, they, you know, not, uh, not all clothing is per going to be perfectly nice. Next item, number six, anything politically, um, <laughs> anything political. <clears throat> now, excuse me, that doesn't necessarily just mean, oh, uh, you know, some political documents or something. It could be a newspaper. It could be Time. It could be Newsweek. It could be you know, the Wall Street Journal. It could be all kinds of stuff. It can be music. It can be um, a, a, a CD. It can be a DVD. It can be a drawing. It can be all this kind of thing that's political in nature or not. And the idea is that it's not in concert or contrary to the laws or government of the destination country. So be very careful about that. Number seven, I know this seems like a duh moment, but you'd be surprised at how, uh, how much <laughs> is caught by um, customs on these kinds of things. So I've placed the, the the obvious things. You're not going to ship a gun. You're not going to ship a gun anyway. Ammunition, but even little things that you may not be thinking about and gun parts, even even things that don't seem or that seem harmless, like just a handle or just a, you know, just a spring or just, a, no, if it's intended for a gun, the answer is no. Additionally, um, this is kind of newer. No 3D printers that are designed for making weapons. Many countries won't allow any 3D printers, no instructions for making weapons, no instructions for making 3D weapons, no molds for making any weapons, and anything related to that, okay? Um, just as a side note, I once had a problem. If you've ever been in the military or had some known someone close to you in the military, and they do all those wonderful uh, parades where they're tossing around the rifle and everything and uh, and they do it so lovely in concert. Well, they have practice rifles that are made out of solid rubber. And I had never known that until somebody came in and needed to ship one of those. Now, it didn't wasn't going international, so I you know I, I had no problem with it. But even something like that going international can be a problem. 
So be aware of that. Um, anything weapon or weapon like because believe me that rubber that rubber shape would have come up on an x-ray real fast or on a scanner okay this one is really broad it's anything of value gift cards credit cards debit cards travelers checks stocks bonds money coins collector coins jewelry gems um uncut diamonds watches gold or silver bullion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Items of value are not to be shipped internationally almost anywhere. That's almost a universal no, no, no. Okay, well, you guys either are bored or listening closely. <clears throat> Next item, number nine. This one's gonna, gonna throw a few of you for a loop, technology. Technology is not allowed in a lot of countries. And when I say technology, I mean things like software, webcams, regular old cameras, cell phones, even individual cell phones, walkie talkies, computers, laptops, tablets, computer parts, um, even, even certain parts of cell phones. And if a cell phone or a laptop is allowed, there's going to be rules about you're only going to be allowed to send one in a, in a shipment. And there's going to be rules about the lithium battery if it's a removable lithium battery or not. So um, you need to check on that really carefully. While I'm on this screen, I want to take a moment to tell you, and many of you have, you know, have been around in the industry for a long time and know about this scam, but some of you are newer and some of you are employees. So I want to share this scam with you because it's been going on for close to 30 years and it's still a strong scam. And here's kind of the way it plays out. A customer comes into your store with a laptop or a cell phone and they want to sell it, send it to a country, usually, and I'm not picking on anybody, usually in Africa, although the Philippines is also a, another concerning destination, but usually Africa. And the favorite country in Africa to send it to would be Nigeria, probably with Ghana a close second. And, um, your customer, if you just send it, you just, you're going to make a profit, it's going to go and the scam will happen. So I would say to you that you need to question your customer and find out, do they actually know the person that they are shipping to? Now, if they do, fine, great, wonderful, no problem. I mean, if your customer knows that person, fine. Um, there's plenty of legitimate reasons to send it, you know, a laptop or cell phone there. But the scam is that somebody in this location got on Craigslist or eBay, um, purchased the laptop or cell phone, and they have a stolen credit card. They give the credit card and it processes through eBay or Craigslist or wherever it's processing. It actually processes because it has not yet been reported stolen. Your customer, innocent person they are, brings it down, pays a fortune to have it shipped, off it goes, and once it's gone, it's pretty much gone. And three days later, the charge is reversed for fraud and they're out the laptop. It happens all the time. I can't tell you, in my 30 years of business, I probably save 12 customers from that scam. 12, I mean, that's a lot. So, uh, and your customer, even though you won't make that, that sale, which would have been a good profit sale, your customer in the end will love you for having saved them a hassle. So uh, please be careful when you're asking because we don't want to offend anybody. It could be somebody they know in this country. And, and I don't mean to pick on any countries, but I want to make you aware that Nigeria is by far the number one, I would say nine out of 10 are Nigeria. So, um, and, you know, oh, thank you for that, Kathy. Um, Kathy says also that our customers might be coached to say that they know the person who's receiving it. So I would get, I would really get in their face about it. Say, I'm going to, you know, if you want me to send it, I'll send it. That's not the problem. I want you to know about this scam and it's real. And here's what they're saying. And they are coaching the, the seller to say that they know you. Um, so just, just kind of a good idea. The last number 10 is kind of a game we're going to play. 
So on this game, I'm gonna describe these items and you're gonna guess which belongs to which. So let me describe it. This is a toy gun. This is cosmetics in the upper right. In the middle is primary educational books in English. In the lower left, clock and clock parts. In the lower right, melatonin, which is a common uh, sleep supplement in the United States. So I want you to, uh, we're just gonna take a, use your question and answer pane for a minute. I'm gonna ask you, what country do you think you cannot ship a toy gun to? It's only one of these that specifically has it on the list. I'm not gonna lie to you and say that they all have it. They don't all have it. One has it, the toy gun. Go ahead and type it in the question and answer pane. It's one of the list over here, Brazil, Mexico, Germany, India, Italy. Okay, three, two, one, stop. Okay, next one, cosmetics in the upper right. What country can you not send cosmetics to? Wow, lots of you think Italy. Okay, three, two, one. This is gonna be fun, you're gonna learn. The primary educational books in English, what country? I love it. Three, two, one. The clocks or clock parts. And it's actually specified clocks and or clock parts. Ah, you guys think you're so smart. And finally, melatonin. And I picked melatonin because it actually says melatonin. It doesn't say supplements. It actually is just melatonin that's not allowed in this country as a supplement. Three, two, one. Okay, now the purpose of this obviously is to show you that you can't guess at these things because none of you got it all right. All of you got something wrong and now I'm gonna share the answers with you. The toy gun cannot be shipped to India. The cosmetics cannot be shipped to Mexico. The uh, primary educational books can, uh, in English cannot be shipped to Brazil. It has to be in Portuguese. The clock and clock parts cannot be shipped to Italy, which leaves the melatonin, believe it or not, cannot be shipped to Germany. Now, if any of you lie to me, you're all welcome to lie to me and say you got them all right, but I know better. <laughs> and just, by the way, I would not have gotten them all right either. I mean, I obviously I got to cheat and have the cheat sheets, but I would not have gotten these rights. And that brings us to the whole idea of why you cannot guess. Um, you've got to look things up. I am going to, <laughs> all wrong. <laughs> I've got several of you saying all wrong. I love it. <laughs> um, don't guess. And you know, if you want to play this game, take a snapshot of this and with your cell phone and play it with your employees. And I'll tell you real again, or again real quickly so you can write it down. Toy gun was India, cosmetics was Mexico, uh, English books were Brazil, clock was Italy, and melatonin was Germany. Okay, so we're gonna move on. Um, and this is gonna give you some ideas on how to ship gifts because our world actually unless you're an unusual store, most of what we ship internationally is a gift. Sometimes it's a business item, but usually it's a gift. And I'm going to say I'm taking a wild guess here and I'm probably terribly off. I'm going to say a third, a third, maybe a quarter of the world has a thing called a gift exemption. It does happen to pertain to the countries that you ship to most. Um, Mexico, Canada, the EU, UK, um, because they're almost not the EU anymore. Uh, many of these countries have a gift exemption. I think Japan does. And basically what it is, is they will allow your customer to send a gift to somebody they know in that country. 
and they won't tax it up to a certain value. That value is approximately $50 US. Now it's actually in the country or the currency of that country. So it could be 55. If it's Canada, it's probably 55 or 60. If it's the UK, it's probably you know 45 or 40, so on and so forth. But it, you get the idea. So around um, $50. And <laughs> tricks to it is it must be from an individual. So if you're customer sending on behalf of his company, then the gift exemption will not apply. Gift exemptions are from a person to a person. If it's a value over $50, like say it's a $200 jacket, well then that country would exempt the first $50 and only tax on the leftover, so the 150. So it does reduce taxes for a higher value item. It is available per person. This becomes really important because <clears throat> At Christmas time, for example, you might have several different gifts in a package for different people. And you can use a gift exemption per person. Now you're gonna to have to make notes. I'm gonna strongly recommend you use the notes field on the customs form, <coughs> excuse me. Also, it's okay to um, have a separate label and handwrite if you need to. Um, yes, the receiver's gonna see what's in the box. You can't, sometimes you just can't, that's international shipping. I want you to always write unsolicited gift. And unsolicited, let me explain what that is. First of all, it's really important to have. But a solicited gift, we're used to the idea, um, we see commercials all the time, you know, call us now and you'll receive a free gift just for signing up. You know, that's a solicited gift. An unsolicited gift is a true gift. I like this person, I know this person, I'm giving them a gift. Usually it's for a relative, it doesn't have to be a relative, but they should have some type of friendship or relationship. So that's why number one, it can't be from a business, and number two, you need to write unsolicited gift. There is a notes field in Postalmate on the customs form, just so you know, <clears throat> but you're welcome to write it on the outside of the box near the label unsolicited gift. And then you can also, it will also help you if you put um, unsolicited, okay, unsolicited gift and um, uh, $50 gift shoes for brother John, uh, $40 shirt gift for sister Joan, you know, blah, blah, blah on there. Um, that kind of helps the customs officials. And you don't have to do this. I'm trying to help your packages, A, get slide through customs, B, get taxed at the lowest possible rate, and see, make your customer in the end happy that there was no residuals. The final suggestion I have for the gift exemption is if you're sending a gift, include a, a birthday or anniversary greeting card. If they don't have one, you should be selling them in your store. So go over there and buy a greeting card, pick one out. We need to include it and make sure you spell it out on the customs form. So if it's a um, $50 pair of trousers, put $48 pair of trousers, okay, lie by $2, I'm okay with it. <laughs> and then birthday card, $2. And if the birthday card is listed as a part of the customs form, it is easily seen by the customs official. It's hard for them to argue with it being a gift if there's a gift card like that enclosed, uh, a birthday card, a greeting card enclosed. But also if they ever have to justify it to their superiors, this is a slam dunk. So you're making it easy for the customs official to not assess taxes on this by including that. And you get to sell a greeting card. So it's a win-win. Okay, and I know I've got a couple of you asking um, why you can't send some of these items to some of those places. I have no idea. I mean, some of them I have guesses, but I have no idea. They don't tell us why on these, they just tell us the items. And I'm gonna show you exactly where I got those particular items so you can see it in a minute. Um, okay, duties and taxes, just so you know how it works. FedEx, UPS, and DHL will always build the receiver first. That's how it's stated on the customs form. If the receiver does not pay, in most cases, they still get the package. The carrier generally will not withhold the package for payment. In that case, the, the sender on the label and customs form will get billed for that package. And that's why it's important that the sender be your customer, not you. If you, the sender, who is your customer, does not pay it, the carrier can have the store pay it, bill the store. Usually they don't. 
Um, but they, they have never written anywhere in black and white that they won't. They've said they won't. I've heard them say it a hundred times, but I cannot get them to put it in writing. Therefore, I will never tell you that they will not bill you. They can bill you. And in fact, I've had one carrier who shall remain nameless say they, they, they might would do that. They admitted they might would do that. So be sure that um, you have that you're the third person in line, not the second person in line. And the way you do that is always make sure you have a customer selected as the return on the package. Postalmate knows that um, the customer that you choose will be the on the return address on the both the customs form and the label. Mind you, the customs form and label must match. The to and the from must match on both of those. That's federal law, U.S. federal law. Um, we don't want any more hiccups than we're going to have. So make sure to uh, get that proper. Um, also, you can, some people have a, 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 an additional paper agreement with their customer that the customer will leave a credit card on file and you can bill that customer if any duties and taxes come up. Um, you can do that or not do that. I, I don't know, I, I never did that, I, but I know stores that do. It becomes a problem. Your customers might have problems with that. So just a thought. Okay, so the moral of the story today is always ask the carrier by either looking up or whatever, get details and find out things. Before we go to some of the helps we're gonna get you, um, I want to go to a couple more screens here. Um, oh, you need to listen to politics, even if you don't like politics, general religion, general history, know, um, know the details and, because mistakes can be costly. And finally, declared value versus customs value. You have two places of entry in Postalmate, one for the DV, declared value, one for the CV, customs value. Declared value is for insurance, customs value is for duties and taxes. One does not necessarily relate to the other. The only rule is that the customs value must be equal or higher than the declared value. So you can have an item that is worth $1,000 and tell customs it's worth $1,000, but you don't have to have, oh, I missed a screen. You don't have to declare the value of $1,000. Maybe the customer doesn't want to insure it. Maybe it's insured through their business insurance. So maybe they don't want to insure it at all. Um, the other thing is you're probably always going to want to say at least $1 on anything, including documents. A documents for Postal Mate is um, already preset to, to go to $1 as a minimum but goods are not, so I'm gonna encourage you to at least have a $1 customs value, not declared value, just customs value. Your declared value can stay zero. And in fact, it's important that your declared value stay zero in many cases, um, if there's no declared value. So don't, don't start throwing in $100 as standard, okay? If any of you use 100, always enter $100 in declared value, stop it. Um, if you just leave it blank, it's covered for whatever declared value coverage is offered by the carrier automatically. Um, if you enter 100 for DHL, you may be charged extra for insurance, for example, because they don't give you a free 100. Uh, they give you a free $11.34 per pound. So if it weighs a pound, all you really get free is $11.34 worth of coverage. And if you enter 100, then they're going to pay for, you're going to pay for coverage between $11.34 and 100. So if you don't want to do that, leave the declared value blank or, or put the actual declared value your customer wants on that. Okay, we're going to get to questions and answers, but before we do that, I'm going to take us to a journey. Um, on your webinar pane, there is a handout section and there is a, a file, a PDF. It's called 10 No-Nos for International Shipping. I want you to all click on that and download it. Now, normally I would tell you at this point that if you are watching this as a recording um, or you, you have trouble with the download here, you can email support and email and support will email it back to you. That is still true if you're gonna watch this as a recorded webinar after today. But for today, as I said earlier, we're having an email outage 
and so it would be tomorrow at the earliest so email us tomorrow um, we will get this up and posted either i'll send you this recording or um, we will post it on our website or both so uh, be watching your emails um, and we'll get that out and go ahead and start putting in any questions and i'm going to pull got postmate here but i'm going to pull up let's see what am i pulling up i have to think about what i'm doing here okay so this is on the handout that i just gave you on the back side are some links and i want you to bookmark those links so when you bring it up I, I do want you to print it, but I also want you to leave it up on your screen, screen and that way you can just minimize it and you can come back to it. And that way the links will actually work into your browser and you should be able to copy paste or just click on them and bookmark them into your computers. And I want you to have them ideally on all of your workstations. But the first one I find is the easiest. The problem is it's a post office one. Now, the good news is, like I said, it's really easy. The bad news is the carriers can have further restrictions that are not reflected on this one. But this is a dy dynamic, <laughs> dynamite is where I was going, a dynamite place to start uh, when with your searching. So I'm going to go really quickly here and let's just go um, really quickly, Brazil. Remember we talked about Brazil and here we go. Here's the one we talked about earlier. Primary educational books not written in Portuguese. Crazy, right? Let's go to um, uh, let's go to Germany. Do, 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 do. Uh, there we go. And let's see where it is. There's the melatonin. Isn't that weird? Out of all the things. I mean, it's a short list. It's right up there with radioactive materials. <laughs> so um, you should be able to click on that link and it should download. Um, most of my stores have been able to get that. Um, and if not, email us tomorrow. And I'm sorry, I can't. You can email us today. We may still get the email. I'm hoping that our email, the email server will retain all incoming inbound emails and that we'll just get them delayed by a day. But I don't know that that for sure that will happen. So this is Italy and let's see, clocks and supplies for clocks. Go figure. So anyways, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but this gives you an idea. This also will tell you for post office what size limits they have in case they have any size limits that are more restrictive than, than typical. And um, if insurance is available through the post office for certain countries don't allow uh, post office insurance to be used. Oddly enough, the UK is one of those. I don't know why, but yeah. So anyways, this is called the Postal Explorer. Some of the other, um, Let's see, this is the this is the handout that you um, should be able to print out. And on the back side of this are the links here. And this is the Postal Explorer one. There's one for FedEx, UPS, DHL. There's also the DHL capability tool, which helps you with addresses. I just thought I'd throw that one in as long as I was giving you some helps here. And this one is super important. The last one, APO, FPO, DPO restrictions. Postalmate knows post office rules. Postalmate does not know military rules. Just because the post office can send a parcel select ground or a priority mail does not mean the military will accept it to a certain zip code. Every zip code that the military has could have different restrictions on size and or weight. And in heightened tensions, especially, we see severe restrictions on this. So your job, when you do send to an APO, FPO, DPO, if it's basically larger than a shoe box, you need to come look and see if there are any additional restrictions you need to know about. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that with tongue in cheek, because in reality, you should check every APO, FPO, DPO, but I know what it's like to work in a store and sometimes things slip by you. But if it's bigger than a shoe box, definitely do that because there are times where I've seen a 12 cube that was too large to ship to an APO, FPO, DPO, um, APO, and these are military installations. And by the way, for you that are newer, APO, FPO, and DPOs can only be sent mail. They cannot be sent UPS, FedEx, or DHL under any circumstances. So please bookmark all of these. I think that they will help you out immensely. 
Okay, now let's see where we are in oh, fudge. I'm such a dork sometimes, guys. Um, let's do there. Ha! Question and answers. So go ahead and type in your questions and answers. Er, questions. Yeah, you answer them too. I'll, I'll ask the questions, you answer them. <laughs> it's one of those days. Type in your questions and I'll see what I can do. I, I don't promise to have all the answers. I, I promise that I'll try. How's that? Um, so somebody said eDelcon is another good resource that someone recently discovered. It lets you know about tracking to international countries through USPS. By the way, if you didn't know, um, when you're tracking a package that you sent USPS, you have two places that you can track it. You can track it at USPS, but often you get more information by tracking it through Indicia from the Indicia website. So um, as you are aware, the carrier always has more information than they give the customer. And so when you, that's why when you call FedEx or UPS or DHL, they always have more than what you can see on the website when you're tracking the item. Um, but the same thing is true for post office. And so Indicia will give you a, often a little bit more information than um, USPS.com will. Um, okay. Um, what's the best way to determine any duties and fees and duties before we send the shipment? Oh my gosh, there, I don't have a solution to that. There are places that you, you can subscribe to that for a fee will help you with that. There is, you can probably become educated and learn some of it on your own. Part of the solution would be you'd have to, you would have to figure out the um, harmonized code for each of those items. Now, harmonized code is not a required element of the customs form unless you're sending commercial to China, I believe. Um, so I don't want you to think that you have to do harmonized code, but if you wanted to figure out duties and taxes on your own, it certainly would involve that because all duties and taxes are based on the on the identified harmonized code. And a harmonized code, folks, is basically every object in the world has a harmonized code. So it's a 10-digit number. I want to say 10. might be 9. I think it's 10. And it's basically is um, a breakdown. So every two digits of the harmonized code leads you further into it. So like a harmonized code of 552462, whatever, might be uh, an iPhone. So the first two numbers might identify it as um, technology. And the next two might say cell phone. And the next two might say Apple cell phone. And the next two might be, be uh, Apple 10 cell phone. I mean, so it kind of goes like that. So that's how, how that is uh, harmonized code works. Um, what is an EEI? I'm so glad you asked. I actually had a slide for that and it disappeared and I apologize for that. An EEI is an e electronic export information and it is a filing. It is not a piece of paper. It's not a form you can fill out. It's not something we can ever include and say, hey, fill this out and your EEI is done. It is actually something you have to go and file with the United States Bureau of Census, Census Bureau. You know, those people that count us, that's the people. Actually, it's part of the Department of Commerce. I know, it's weird. So if you want to learn how to do an EEI on your own, you can, but... For a very small fee, the carriers will do it for you. You just need to contact them. Here's when it's ne needed. It is needed if you have a commodity with a value of $2,500 or higher. So a commodity is one item or a group of identical or similar items. So my favorite example is leather jackets. Let's say you had a box of 10 leather jackets and they were all $500 a piece. But some were women's and some were men's and some were children's and some were long and some were short and some were bomber and some were, you know, all motorcycle jackets. They were all different types of leather jackets. Folks, that is one commodity. They're all leather jackets. Doesn't matter the style, size, whether it's for a man or a woman or a child, those are leather jackets. That's one commodity. And even though there's 10 different, different types in there, it is treated as one commodity that would require an EEI uh, to be sent internationally. In that case, you can contact UPS, FedEx, and DHL. They will all assist you with that. I wanna say the fee for that is like 10 or $15 and worth every penny. Now, if you do a ton of international shipping and you wanna learn how to do an EEI on your own, good for you. 
I don't want to ever have to do it myself. I've seen it. I've done it. I don't like it. So, um, and you're talking to a person who's done on all, and, and is very respectful, <laughs> respectful of the international shipping world. But we do have stores, especially who specialize in international for businesses that do EEIs on their own regular. So I, I'm never going to tell you not to, but it is a, a steep learning curve. And kudos for those of you who can do it. Um, oh, let's see. Should we oh, wait? Oh, so should we select show customer return address on your shipping labels? Um, yes. So let me just go real quickly for for in Postal Mate for international automatically UPS, FedEx, and DHL is going to show this person here when we're shipping. Come on, internet. Whoever you pick here as the customer, see this customer screen, whoever you pick here, that's going to be on the label and on the customs form on an international. We all know on a domestic label, it's going to be your store, but on an international Postmate is pre-programmed to put in the customer. So that's not a concern. For post office services, um, most of you use Indicia, hopefully all of you do. You should have pre-selected in your Indicia settings, and I'll go to mine. And when we go into carrier setup, USPS in Indicia settings right here, under options, you should have selected use customer as return address. And that will, that will affect all, that will not be just affecting international, but your customer should be the return address on all post office shipments. Now, some of you may say, but if I do that, then, and if the package has to be returned, then it's gonna get returned to my customer instead of me. Yep, it sure will. Um, but that's the way the cookie crumbles. Now, some of you may also say, but then the, the carrier might, if it can't be delivered, the carrier might return it to my customer and I'll never know about it until I get billed for it. Ah, ah, ah. First of all, UPS, FedEx, and DHL is not allowed to bill you for return transportation without your permission. So if that happens, and believe me, it will, because it happens to all of us at some point or time, you need to dispute that. Okay, they are required to contact you and get your permission before returning it. And if you want at that time, you can ask them to send it to your store. I'm not saying they will, they will probably send it to the return address on there. But you can say something to the effect of, can you give me your phone number and give me 24 hours? That'll give you an opportunity to call your customer and say, this package was unable to be delivered. If you want it returned, it'll be $248. Uh, would that be a credit card or do you wanna come in and pay cash today? Um, take care of that. If they don't want to do it, then the, the, the uh, carrier is most likely more than willing to abandon it at that country. So, uh, <clears throat> can you ship to an APO in the United States via FedEx? No, only post office. Um, college students mailing their clothing home, would that go through customs? Yes, it would. Um, not today, Chris. Uh, FedEx has a tool to estimate duties and taxes. Yes, I believe some or all of the primary carriers do have a tool. I don't have access to that. I believe, and I'm not 100% sure, I believe you have to actually be logged into your account to find or to have access to it. So that's why I did not provide that for you. It would behoove all of you during your slow moments yeah, well, hopefully you don't have too many of those, but during your slow moments to explore the carrier websites, particularly on the international tools. They change frequently and they're usually um, improving. So because your carriers tr are really trying to make it easy for you to ship international because that's where the money is. Um, so if you have an American relative living in Brazil, you could not send them children's books in English. Um, children's, yes, educational books. That is an absolute true statement. Uh, all right, Wh whoa, I just lost all of that where I was. Oh, hang on, going back down. Okay, um, what should we tell the customer when shipping international about duties and taxes? Well, tell them, yeah, there's gonna be duties and taxes that you should be upfront about this. Um, if, that, if the country um, says there's gonna be duties and taxes on the items and, and you don't know whether they are because you're not, that's not your job. Your job is to ship it, not to assess duties and taxes. Then the receiver or the shipper will end up paying them. Are they aware of that? I would absolutely make them conscious of that. Um, it could stop them from, prohibit them from shipping it. 
And I know it's a sale lost, but it's a, it's a relationship saved when you do things like that. Um, return shipments, are the rules the same for domestic? No, your FASC, uh, DASC, excuse me, your FASC and uh, ASO contract, so your UPS and FedEx contract, allow for return shipment domestically without your permission, and they should not bill you. That's part of your ASO and FASC contract. Um, the handout is part of your webinar pane. Um, there should be an area where it says handouts. I can, I, I could show you, well, I can't show you mine. Mine looks different than yours because obviously I'm running the thing, so my webinar pane is like, you know, 12 inches long, so I can't, can't show, I, I can't show you what yours would look like right now. Is it possible for the shipper to pay duties and taxes in advance for the recipient? Thank you, Jennifer. That's a great question. Boy, if I had a prize to give out today, you would get it. And can they do that through us? So let me explain. The answer is yes and no, but not through Postalmate. If your customer wants to prepay or pay the duties and taxes, you'll need to complete a way bill or process the shipment on the carrier's website um, or through their car the carrier's um, uh, software if you have it, happen to have it downloaded. Um, and then you can put in their credit card number. Here's the problem. If it ends up $500, they're going to come back and yell at you thinking that it was only going to be $20. So just be aware of that, that, you know, but yes, you can um, uh, do it that way. Here's why you cannot with Postal mate, because we'd love to give you that option. But here's the explanation. We are set up with the API, which is some uh, tech, techno lingo that developers use, but it's basically the interface between the carrier and our software. And that during that API, we have to make a lot of choices, like the language that the labels are going to come through on and the size of the labels. And we standardize, have to standardize all that so that there's not too many choices. Well, the carrier requires standardization on the API. You know, here's your choice, pick one. Here's your choice, pick one. And that's what they do with um, uh, duties and taxes. Here's your choice, pick one. And it's the same way for every shipment for every one of our customers. And it was, you know, we had the choice of having your customer pay it, but what if your customer doesn't want to pay it? So the safest way was to have the recipient pay it. And so that was one of the options that were given. Um, and that's what we have we have chosen uh, a long time ago. I know it doesn't work for all of you, I get that, but we have to work on the majority of our stores and the majority of our stores definitely want the, the receiver to pay for it or be billed first. And by the way, FedEx and UPS and DHL don't typically bill the receiver, they typically bill the shipper. So if you get billed, dispute that, um, it's usually an error. Mind you, the carrier has hundreds of thousands or perhaps millions of account holders, FASCs, DASCs, and ASOs are the only group that get exempted from those rules. So you, the person you're talking to with billing may have no clue that your contract exempts you and they may be 100% sure you're lying through your teeth because it's that way with every one of their uh, other customers. You're gonna be the exception to the rule. Yeah, no, you're not gonna restart now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, don't you love those Windows updates? Um, okay, let's go through. Oh, see, uh, scrolling down to more questions. <sighs> Post office across the street says that she sends clothing to Mexico all the time, no problems. Are they just lucky? Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, Post of across the street, yeah. Uh, often, um, I think Mexico for used clothing is probably a bad idea. I'm trying to remember, but I'm pretty sure that's one of the, let's go here. Oh, yeah, here. Let's go here and just and look together. J J K L M. There we go. A, B, C, D, right? Um, there we go. And these are no's. And mind you, there's no's and then there's restrictions. Here's that chocolate. And here's, um, look at this, cosmetics. Remember I said no cosmetics? Look at that. Um, okay, so I'm not seeing, am I missing it? I'm not seeing 
clothing, but I think we all know that there's some problem. There are often problems with clothing, used clothing going to Mexico. So it could be something that post office, you get it through, but UPS, FedEx and DHL, you can't, I don't know. Um, I've just always see, that's one of those things I've always heard, no clothing to Mexico. So use clothing, by the way, if it's got, oh, thank you, Sarah, brilliant. Um, you're probably correct on that. Um, I'm going to get to that in a second. Leave, if it's new clothing, always put in new pair of jeans, new pair, uh, new shirt, new pair of trousers. By the way, way use trousers, not wor the word pants. Pants in England is your underwear. So they'll laugh at you, dumb Americans, you know. Um, yeah, trousers, but, or slacks. But um, Sarah Rohde uh, from our company brought up the great uh, uh, reminder to me. Uh, Mexico has issues, as m all countries do, issues with certain other countries. And one of the, the primary country Mexico has issues with is China. And so a lot of clothing is made in China. A lot of things are made in China. So things that are made in China, either you often cannot send to Mexico or a significantly high tariff is placed on the item going to, to uh, Mexico if it was made in China. So yeah, there's all these kind of weird things. I had a couple of people mention that. See, Joyce knew. So you guys are clever. Um, and by the way, the post office self brokers and is not as regulated, if you're ever wondering, is not as regulated um, as heavily as UPS, FedEx, and DHL. UPS, FedEx, and DHL are, are seriously regulated. Post office, not so much. And that's why, unfortunately, it's both cheaper and often something will get through post office and arrive without duties and taxes, whereas if you had sent it UPS, FedEx, or DHL, the receiver would have to pay duties and taxes. It's, it's ugly. It's an ugly truth. Okay. I think we've gotten through most of the questions. I hope so. Um, I'm sorry if I've missed your questions. I would love to have you, um, uh, you know, email them to me, but I probably won't get them until tomorrow. Sorry. Um, also, I, I am getting a couple. I had a couple of you mention this, so I'm going to just mention it now. Um, and I'm going to go through in Postmate and do a shipment. There's something when you're sending ground to Canada, there's something called a brokerage fee. Now, there's a brokerage fee that can be involved in all international shipping. But ground to Canada, it's a little bit, it's more common to have that charge come back and bite you. So mm -hmm. I'm going to try to do this. Bear with me here. Let's see if I can do a Canadian shipment here. Okay. Let's go there. Let's see if that's a good address. Some of my addresses are so freaking old. They're not good anymore. So I apologize. It happens when you have a billion years in business. Okay. And I did not do that. I did too. Okay, let's try that again. Okay, remember this one? Always enter customs value. Okay, I'm just going to go there. Um, and let's go FedEx. Okay, so see this international ground shipment and then this international ground shipment. Um, this is based on the, the customs value. So if we go, let's go 500. I'm going to say there might be an increase. There's not an increase. Okay. I want to say that with FedEx, this brokerage fee is actually now included in this shipment. UPS sometimes comes back and bills it. Now, I can be wrong on that, but I don't think I'm wrong. And I can follow up with this. We are over the summer going to have some international webinars that are going to be specific to a carrier. So before I do the FedEx and the UPS specific international webinars, I will find out about the brokerage fee and how it's applied for ground to Canada for both UPS and FedEx. Those are the only two carriers that we have to offer it. So um, I will get those answers. But my belief was that with you with within. Um, FedEx, they incorporated it into the shipping now. And with UPS, um, they sometimes bill after, and sometimes your rep will, will, get, will waive it, but often lately I'm, I'm not seeing that fee waived as much. So 
that's the end of our webinar today. I'm sure a few of you have some questions you'll think of as soon as we finish. If so, just email them to us. If you don't hear back, feel free to email it again after today. Um, we've been told our emails will be up and working um, sometime within the next day. I'm hoping by, at least by the end of the day, you can imagine how crippling it is for us. And if you need support, please call support today. Um, normally I tell you an email is faster and 99.9% .9 of the time it is, but just not today. So <laughs> thank you all for watching. Uh, the DHL update will be, like I said, this week. Um, it's, uh, I'm not going to, I can't spoil their announcements, so I'm not going to say anything for many of you. It may not affect you at all, but, um, let's just say for those of you who are RS premium members, you probably should stay tuned to your emails from them today. So, um, or this week anyway. So thank you very much. And I hope you have a great day. Take care and I'll see you at the next webinar. Bye-bye folks.